Well, Kathy and I just returned from a vacation we've been saving up for a very long time for. Uh, and people keep asking me how it, how it was. And really, I came back a little bit spiritually shell-shocked. Um, and I'm still wrestling through that. We, uh, we went to Europe. We went to London and Paris. My son was there and, his, and my daughter-in-law. So, you know, went to St. Minster, or Westminster Cathedral, St. Paul's, uh, and, and probably in my own heritage, I grew up Roman Catholic, but I would say the Anglican is probably like who I would say those, those are kind of my people. Uh, and they were beautiful. They had money to restore the buildings. And I said, oh, I want to go there and worship. And they had a prayer service. And uh, so everyone's walking, you know, people go around. Mostly people are taking pictures because it's beautiful. They have the funds to keep their, their building beautiful. But the, the prayers were, I mean, everything was prim and proper, totally monotone, totally, with, totally dispassionate, as if um, to convey this sense of timelessness and gravitas, we just want to strip it of all human personality. And it had no heart. It had no spirit. Uh, and, and my spirit was wanting to, to enter into worship someplace. So we would, as we could, we would just find a quiet spot to sit and, and do some meditative prayer and then take the pictures and, oh, this place is awesome. Um, but what really, what really broke my heart was all these monuments within the church for the uh, political heroes, the military heroes who went out and conquered in the empire's name. Uh, when, an, when you needed a favor, that you would hold the orb and scepter of God. You would receive this, the orb and scepter, when you became crowned king, and the church would come and anoint you. This orb was there. It's a round ball. It has a little cross on it to remind you that the earth is the Lord, and you're, you're, ruling, you're ruling answerable to him. But in reality, what often takes place is, well, God is absent. And I'm in charge until he comes back. And I'll do as I see fit. And your job, church, is to tell the people I'm God's anointed for the divine right of kings. And if they go against me, they're going against God. And therefore, treason against me is punishable by death and confiscating your properties. And if you challenge the church, well, that's treason against me because the church is, is lifting up me, the emperor, and so the same thing. So now you have religious wars and persecutions and burning at the stake. Just all that ugliness that has gone on in the past. So that, that weighed heavy on my soul to see that in art and in monuments within the church and the graves and all this exalting men in the name of God. And then in Eastern Europe, they were a little bit more, they were just out there with it. So you'd have these beautiful, I mean, the church is twice as high as this. And it's just, it was just this mind-boggling, baroque, visual noise upon noise upon noise upon noise of just filigree and just, it's like a poorly designed website when they first came out when you had to have every flashing, spinning, sparkling thing on there. And no, folks, less is more, right? So I come from the, the, that sense of Frank Lloyd Wright that says less is more, you know, uh, nature in, in one in those spaces. But this was, this was not less is more, it's we are more, and we need to get God's attention. So always fighting for God's attention. Uh, and that broke my heart uh, because I just wanted to pray. And, and, the, and this collusion of church and state really started to spend me, send me down a spiral of seeing how that has played out in the past over centuries and how that's playing out today. And that's not what I want the sermon to be about, not about the collusion of church and state, because you can see, we'll see it all around us. Um, we're the people in power. You, you put your seal of God's approval upon us and we'll go and do what we do and, and we, will, we will bless you and support you. Uh, and if you go against us, we will crush you. We'll ruin your reputation. We'll take away your livelihood. We'll confiscate your property. We don't so much kill people anymore. We just cancel them. Um, but that's, that's how that plays out today. Um, 
but there was a couple of really beautiful examples uh, that were total different spirit that I'm going to bring in a little bit later. But the, the, first, the first thing we want to look at in our passage today from, uh, where are we at? We're in Matthew 16, um, verse 5. Uh, and Jesus, Jesus warns his disciples. Now, after he's fed thousands with a few loaves of bread, he's, he's walked on water, he's worked miracles. Um, then they have this confrontation with the Pharisees. They says, well, you've been doing, you've been doing miracles for everybody else. Do some, do some miracles for us. Prove to us who you are. We're searching the scriptures. We know the scriptures. Now, you know, we'll, if you do the right miracles, we'll know you're, you'll know you're the son of God. And Jesus says, Phew. it's an evil, adulterous generation that looks for signs and wonders and miracles. So he says, Let's, they leave the Pharisees and, and they get, I think they're, they're on the boats and they get to the other side and the disciples says, oh, we forgot to buy bread. Duh. Uh, and Jesus says, well, watch and beware the leaven of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. So they're worried about the bread being, you know, ritually impure. I don't know, we were eating the wrong bread. And then they realize, oh, he's talking about the teaching of the Pharisees and Sadducees. Because it gets into everything. When, when those who proclaim that they, they have God figured out, we have the system for how God works, the system for how you get the blessings of God, right? Systems for, for how you go to heaven instead, instead of hell. Systems for what are the right things I need to believe to escape God's just punishments and his wrath, right? So you need to come to us. We're the experts. We'll tell you what you need to believe. Um, and that seeps into everything um, because there, was, there is within us, there is in that sense a true self that's created in the image of God. And there's a false self that has sort of metastasized over time with the thinking of men in the teaching of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. This re- putting things into a religious system by which we control God and we manipulate, and we, because we manipulate through fear, we think God is manipulating through fear. And the false self is extremely good at religious systems and bending the system to serve you, to, f- to feel your need for power and control, security and survival, esteem and affection. So the Pharisees did it through the religious system. The Sadducees, it's like, well, there's this, there's this whole other, this is Roman Empire we have to deal with. This is our reality. So how do we make the best of a bad situation? So they're far more secular in their approach, far more pragmatic. Uh, how do I, you know, I can't kick, I can't overthrow Rome. In fact, we don't want to overthrow Rome because that's not going to end well for us. So how do we, how do we connect ourselves to the people in power and do the best we can for me and my family. And if that means I'm oppressing my people in their name, well, you know, someone's got to do it. It's going to happen, so might as well be me. Um, so that's sort of that downward spiral we could look into and get. You can get very political at that, but the truth is this is the human condition. It's not the, it's not the condition of the party on the left or the party on the right. It runs right through the center of all of us, that we all have this. And that's why we need to be aware of it so that we can take a different path and, uh, and, listen, and listen to a truer spirit. Yeah, so with that, we'll, we'll, turn to our, we'll turn to our passage in Matthew 16, 13 to 14. Um, and Jesus, so when they came to the... So these, these are right in consecutive order in the scriptures, and they're, they're laid out there for a reason, I think. Matthew knew what he was doing. Uh, Now, when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say that the Son of Man is? And they said, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. You know, it's kind of like today, you know, people talk about the second coming, and we're reading this book and that book, and Left Behind, and, uh, you know, dispensational theology, and we got our charts and timelines and everything worked out. A lot of speculation going on, a lot of proof texting. Um looking to the Bible experts, to this, this expert or that expert, what do you need to know in order not to miss out on the second coming? Well, it was kind of the same thing in their day with the first coming of the Messiah. They're looking for the Messiah. And they had a system that Jesus was going to fit into. And it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a hot mess of Zionism, uh, yeah, milita- take over by military force and overthrow Rome. It's a, it's a mixture of having the appropriate sacrifices and, and the teaching of the Pharisees and 
Uh, God, is, God is the ultimate Pharisee. He's, he's a lot like us, but, but bigger and more powerful. Um, and he wants to be approached a certain way and a certain sacrifices. And if you don't do it right, well, the wrath of God abides on you and he's going to punish our nation because of your sins. So you better get your act together. Um, and we're going to make sure you do it. We're going to be the, we're going to be the moral police and make sure you, you line up and so that God will bless us and not curse us. And that's obviously, that's who the Messiah is going to be on steroids. That's, that's, who, that's who he needs to be. And so if you, you need to know what people are saying. What is God like? So, because it's going to influence what you think. You're going to, it's going to become part of your culture and you're just going to take that in through osmosis. I mean, that's how culture works, you know. Uh, when I, if, we're, if, if we pass in the hallway, Bill, I'm going to go to the right, and you're going to go to the right, so we don't bump into each other. Well, I go in London, they had a different culture, and they're on the left, and I'm, on, and I'm like, are you going left or right? And so, we're, you know, you're kind of dancing. That's, that's through the culture. Well, we have these cultural understandings about God. So what are those? What are some of those cultural misunderstandings? Well, misunderstandings, right? Half-truths, things that aren't thought out. So what are those things in our culture? Well, I think the um, thing I hear a lot, God's a God of love, but he's also a God of justice. That God's holiness requires him to punish. That justice is about punishing the wrongdoer. That works well for empires. You come up against the... You come up against the emperor, it's like in the tower, off with his head, you know? He's, he's treason. Um, people political, so there's, you know, I'm not going to go there. Um, malinformation, so there's, there's disinformation, misinformation, and malinformation. Disinformation is an intentional lie. Misinformation is, you thought you're, you were saying something right, but... You really didn't know what you were talking about and confusing people. And um, what they call malinformation is it's the truth and it's correct, but it's harmful to the institution. Therefore, it has to be put down. It has to be censored. It has to be silenced. And that's sort of the, the culture we live in. We justify our bad actions to defend our institutions. Uh, and we do this in politics. We do this in corporations. We do this in the church. It's just the way the false self works. And if you're not aware of it, you're gonna, just going to take in the justifications for doing this that come in through our culture. So who do people say that God is? Uh, just, just to identify that, right? In their day, it was, yeah, some say John the Baptist, Elijah, and others, Jeremiah, or one of the prophets, which all had roles assigned to them. So who is this God? This, this God, is he, is he absent? Was, he, was Jesus here in the flesh and then he ascended on high and he's off in heaven somewhere and he's handed things over to us to rule and, until he comes back and then, you know, then it's clobbering time. I don't know, what, what is that image of God that's coming through our popular culture? I, I think one of them is uh, the universe, right? God is the universe. God is the universe becoming aware of itself. So um, is, that, is, that, uh, is that who we think God is? God is sort of the... Uh, all the power of the universe, but not really a whole lot of intellect or knowledge, and it's, it's becoming aware. The universe is becoming aware of itself. <laughs> surprise, surprise, through us, so that we're the pinnacle of creation. Well, that, that kind of worked out well in our favor, didn't it? So, um, but anyway, so that's, that's the first question. The second question is, is uh, but who do you say that I am? And this is, this is important because we need to own our own thoughts. See, it's easy to push it off. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to push off my theology on Zondervan or on the Catholic Church or on the National Association of Evangelicals or upon the charismatic, whatever that is, the charismatic circles that I run in, the, the, um, the people we're lifting up as prophets and hearing from God. And yes, we're learning from people and they're, they're, all those in ministry have a role of helping us to learn to abide in the presence of God and recognize his voice. They're not there to hear on your behalf and make the decisions for you, to, to worship for you. They're there to help you enter into the holy of holies. It's sometimes frightening to get off the fence with our beliefs and saying, what, 
What am I claiming this belief is my own? Who do I say that he is? And now I can profess some, some oh, he's, uh, you know, we've all heard Peter say, you're, you're the Christ, the son of the living God. So we just learn to profess that, but we don't really let the Lord take, let, put that, plant that deep into our hearts and let that take root and transform us. This is, this is the thing about um, the revelations of God. They can happen in three ways. They can happen externally through your external eyes and ears and you know, see a bright light, hear a flash, hear a voice from heaven, whatever. That, that's one way. It can happen in the imagina- imaginary senses, in your eyes and in the eye of your mind or the, the, the voice in your, you know, your internal voice in your head that you sort of hear, discern a voice. That's another type of locution. And another one is in the core of your spirit, which is really beyond words, beyond images. And those, or it might be a word or image that just happens in a flash. It's like over, and they're usually unlooked for. It's not something you build up. They just, they, they, they strike when God wants them to strike. And it leaves that seed in you. And it might take a lifetime for that seed to germinate, take root, and transform. And it will continue to unfold over a lifetime. And I think this is, this is what Peter has experienced. So let's, next verse. So Simon Peter replied, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus answered him saying, blessed is Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my father who is in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter and on this rock I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Then he strictly charged the disciples to tell no one that he was the Christ. Now, that's interesting. So you are the Christ, the son of the living God. So we get the, we get the name of God. Right? We, we're, getting, we're beginning to see this Trinitarian communion, Father, Son, and later on we'll see the, the Holy Spirit. Uh, Emmanuel, God is with us. All right? we, we're giving these names of God. Yeshua, God is salvation. And these words are, we, we, however we receive them through scriptures, through teachers, through preaching, through, through books we've read, but when God speaks them, they get implanted into our heart and he is revealing something and it takes root there and he draws us into deeper communion, into that deeper truths. Not just, not just truths that our reasoning wrestle with, but that actually transcends reason. And it, I don't have words for that. There is this gravitas, the sense of presence, the sense of union of God with us that we are called into. You are the Christ, son of the living God, the one in whom we live and move and have our being. We will see this later. The first Adam became a living soul. The second Adam, Jesus, the eschatos Adam, becomes a life-giving spirit. It's not about getting credit for having the right theology. It's like, oh, if you profess the right things, God says you're in, you go to heaven instead of hell. Uh, your faith is efficacious, but everyone else, they're, you know, on the chopping block um, forever and ever and ever without end. Um, no, Peter says, you are the Christ. This, you, you, are, you are the Messiah. You're the son of the living God. You are, you are God with us. And, and he says, oh, I tell you, you're Peter. And on this rock, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. So uh, flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my father who is in heaven. So how did, was Peter aware that the father revealed that to him? I don't know. I don't know if he was aware. He just, he knew that he knew. Uh, He might not have had this, doesn't say. Might have happened while he was out fishing. Might have happened while they were just walking with Jesus. 
And it's like when the question was put to him, it's like, oh, it comes to his understanding of what he, what he knows in his knower in the depth of his spirit. Um, on this rock, I will build my church. So what is the rock? Is the rock the succession of Peter, as, as Rome would claim, the, the papacy? Is the rock what the evangelicals would claim? Well, no, no, the rock is his profession of faith. You know, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And then they would usually throw in that, uh, yeah, I've sinned against God, God is righteous, um, I'm deserving of my punishment, so I'm deserving of eternal hell. Jesus came to take the, the wrath of God so I don't have to in my place as a penal substitutionary atonement. And if I will profess that system, then it's efficacious for me and now I get to go to heaven when I die. Is that, is that the rock? That the gates of hell won't prevail against it? Well, I think if we were to look at the um, imperial church of Rome or the empire of the evangelical church, um, we would find a lot, of, a lot of skeletons in the closet, right? We, we have cozied up with a lot of people in power, uh, whether it's government, whether it's industry, whether it's media, whatever. People who can, who can make life, who can bless us and make things go well for us and who can hurt and cancel us if we go against them. Um, the proof texts, you know, you see proof texts of uh, slavery, racism, uh, that people have proof, te proof text out of Scripture. Really, uh, whatever we want, we can pretty much proof text out of Scripture because they say the false self is very good at religious systems. So is the kingdom of God a religious institution? Is it a profession of professing the right things? And I want to I wanna posit something else, and, and you don't have to accept this, um, but what I would like to posit is that the rock is the, rev the Father revealing, God with us, God speaking into your spirit. And those words, like I said, they might come through scripture, they might come through teaching, they might come through something else, but it's God revealing them in you. That is the rock that the gates of hell cannot prevail against. When, when the addict, the drug addict, turns to God, surrenders and asks for help, right? Turning to the, to the higher power. They don't know what they believe. They just, they know they need help and they're crying out to God. And he's saying, Lord, save me, come to me. And the Lord says, I will be with you. I'll walk with you through this and I'll surround you with people who will help lift you up, right? They cannot do that in their own strength. That, that rock that delivers them out of hell is the revelation of God in them that God is speaking something to them. When, a, when the missionaries go off, have gone off and died on the mission field, and they didn't do that for the sake of the institution of the empire or the institution of the church. They were led as they were called by God. And you hear how the prophets who, who had the courage to speak truth to power and how they were martyred and killed. That's the revelation of the Father that the gates of hell cannot prevail against. And I will give to you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Now we're going to see Peter kind of pick up those keys, uh, or at least thinks he's picking them up. And um, I've had about 20 years in the charismatic church too, so I kind of get where people, how they run with this and how they misuse it. That if I, if, I, if I get the right profession, if I, if I have certitude and, and, and don't let any words of doubt enter my thinking or my speech, well, then I will have this keys of power, the kingdom of heaven to bind and loose. All right, I'll have the scepter and the orb in the spiritual realm to do as I will. So I, my life can be blessed and not hard. I can be, you know, whether it's rich, fame, uh, health, save my marriage, whatever that is, we're going to name it and proclaim it and manifesto, you know, poof, it's done. Hallelujah. Amen. Uh, is that what the keys are? And so I'm going to, I'm going to posit that um, they're a little something different. Uh, and then he strictly tells them to tell no one that he was the Christ. Now, why would Jesus do that? Well, because 
the Messiah in their mind had a very specific role of, of overthrowing Rome, of setting up the Messianic Empire in place of the Roman Empire. And they had a place in that empire. We're going to sit at Jesus' right and his left, and we're going to be, we're going to be the new aristocracy upon the earth. And uh, we're going to have it made if we just stick with them through this rough beginning. Uh, and Jesus says, yeah, maybe it's just better if you just this ixnay on the messiah, messiah nay thing, you know, uh, for now. Um, until you really learn who I am and what I'm calling you to. So then in the next verses, right? So following verses. Uh, from that time on, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things for the elders and chief priests, from the elders and chief priests and scribes, I would say for them as well, and be killed and on the third day be raised. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him saying, far be it from you, Lord, this will never happen to you. We have plans for you. And we know God has plans for you, and it's not this, it's not this suffering stuff. Uh, but he turned to Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan. You are a hindrance to me. If you are not setting your minds on the things of God, or the, you are not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. This is the very nature of the false self. The false self cannot... In, in the book of John, the, big, very, the beginning end of the gospel of John, right? In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was with God, and the word was God. And the, and the light shines in the darkness. This light was the light of men. And the darkness cannot comprehend it. It can't, it, it, it can't even begin to, to comprehend the things of God. The, the, the false self just cannot discern the things of God. So the false self is always set on the things of man. Let's go ahead and go to the, the next verse. Then Jesus told his disciples, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Whoever would save his life will lose it, and whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. For what will it profit for a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul? Or what will a man give in return for his soul? For the Son of Man is going to come with his angels in the glory of his Father. He will repay each person according to what he has done. Truly, truly, I say to you, there are some standing here who will not taste death until they see the coming, the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. So deny yourself and take up your cross. It's, it's, it's in the suffering. It's in the suffering where the false self is dethroned. It's in the suffering when we start deconstructing what the world professes about God. The teaching of the, the Pharisees and the Sadducees gets deconstructed. The systems that we have put God into of how I will use God to have blessing in this life, to be the head and not the tail, those things get deconstructed in suffering. It's when what we believed about God gets, it's where what we believed about God gets put to the test. And when we get stripped away, this refining fire. Um, in, in the refining of fire, they'll often add flux to the mix and then put it in the crucible. And as it gets molten, the flux helps loosen the, the grip of the impurities in the silver, and it floats, it floats to the surface, and then it can e be easily removed. God is a refining fire. And it is that crucible of suffering, of taking up our cross, our responsibilities, the things we would really rather not have in our lives, the betrayals, the, the financial setbacks, the loss of reputation or the loss of income or the loss of life, loss of health, the loss of life. It's in that crucible that God is doing some really miraculous work to reveal himself. Sasha, would you pull up the image of the silversmith, please? Um, so we are at one of the monasteries. I said there was a couple of really bright lights. And this was a, this was a persecuted monastery. They, they actually just carved it out in caves in, the, in a hillside. Uh, no marble, no, no fancy gold leaf, just rough rock-hewing caves. Uh, and really, uh, and they, they had a story that they were telling. And, I, and this, you may have heard this before of other places. 
but um, that the silversmith holds the silver, the refiner's fire. He holds it in the hottest part of the fire, and he never takes his eye off it, not even for a second. He watches it intently, holding it within the flames until the impurities come out. So not holding it too far away so that it remains unchanged and not holding into it so long so that the silver vaporizes or melts and is ruined and falls into the coals. And, and so someone asked, well, how does, how does the silversmith know? How does he know when the silver's ready, when it's not been too long or too short? He says, well, it's easy. When the impurities are gone, he sees his face. It shines like a mirror. Isn't that beautiful? In one of the other monasteries, um, the new abbot, and this monastery's been around for over a thousand years. And when a new abbot comes, they get, they, they get two things. I forget what the first one's, but they get, to give a, they get to make up a motto for the monastery for as long as they're the abbot. In this abbot, his motto was, God is communion. God is communion. That when we come to these cathedrals, when we come to these places of prayers, when we come to the sanctuary, what I want is to commune with God. Because God is revealing himself to me. God is revealing Jesus to me, and Jesus is revealing the Father. And all this is done by his spirit abiding within us. Now there can be a fear. Well, what if I get God wrong? What if I, what if I confuse what God is saying with what my false self is saying or Heaven forbid, like Peter, right? Get behind me, Satan. I, I don't want to get it wrong. But here's the beautiful, beautiful thing about Peter. He wasn't afraid to step out of the boat. He wasn't afraid that he might go under the waves because he knew the Lord was there to grab him. And I, I'm going to give you a little spoiler alert about the false self. Colluding with Satan, it's already doing it all the time. It's not something that happens when you step out and say, I think the Father's revealing something to me. No, that's what sets you free. Your default mode of operation is constantly thinking with the mind of men and going about the works of Satan. In, in, in that sense of the Satan being the adversary, the absence of the good. We all have an absence of the good that we're working in and all right, we're, sick, we're seeking to get our piece of the good from somebody else. A disordered good is, is, a, is an evil. And the, the solution for that is to put it to order, to put it, to put it in its proper functioning. When, you're, when you're, your body goes awry, you get cancer or something. It's because the body's out of whack. It starts immune disease. The body starts attacking itself. This part starts growing too much, and this other part starts dwindling too little. It's just... It's a disordering, and, and God comes to reveal your true nature. Your true nature is the image bearer of God. Your true nature is to be a vessel, not filled with glitz and glamour, but filled with worship and praise, and Jesus being revealed in you, Christ in you, the hope of glory for which all creation waits. That is your true nature. And that only comes through God revealing it to you. And you're going to have to own it. Not because God will withdraw it, but because until you own it, until you start walking in, I think this is what God is revealing to me. It's not going to get tested. It's the, the true self and the false self within all of our thinking. It's not going to get judged and sorted out until we start walking in it. And you surround yourself. You, 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 you saturate your mind with scripture. You saturate your soul in prayer. You saturate your emotional self, your social self, with people of God, with saints who are, are further along in the walk than you, and saints that are a little further behind, and you're all helping each other discern the action and presence of God within. And we call that spiritual community, and it's a beautiful thing. I'm going, to, I'm going to close here. We're going to do a spiritual exercise. It's just, just going to take a, just a couple minutes. If 
I can find it. Okay. So Jesus had said, there will be some standing here who will not taste death until they see the, the until, well, let me, get it, let me get it straight. Truly I say to you, there are some standing here who will not taste death until they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. And after six days, Jesus took with him Peter and James and John, his brother, and led them up to a high mountain by themselves. I'd like you to close your eyes. And whether you want to imagine this scene, um, I, I have very, I, I'm, one of, I'm almost, what do they call, apophasic. I can't, I can't pick, see much with my mind's eye when I try to. Um, but if you can picture the scene, picture it. Otherwise, just, just imagine then that it's happening around you. And that you're somewhere in this scene. Maybe you're one of the, maybe you're Peter, James, or John. Maybe you're Jesus or Moses or Elijah or, or just a bird watching from a tree. So Jesus took them and led them up to a high mountain by themselves. And he was transfigured before them, and his face shone like the sun, and his clothes became white as light. And behold, there appeared to them Moses and Elijah talking with him. And Peter said to Jesus, Lord, it is good that we are here. If you wish, I will make three tents here, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. He was still speaking when, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them, and a voice from the cloud said, This is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. When the disciples heard this, they fell on their faces and were terrified. Have you ever had an encounter with the presence of God that was so overwhelming to your senses? It left you unmoored, undone. Your psyche and your body. I will not survive this. For in truth, the false self cannot. But Jesus came and touched them, saying, Rise, and have no fear. When they lifted up their eyes, they saw no one but Jesus only. Does so the Father hold you in the crucible of life? He's revealing. He's revealing Jesus. And most of the time, that is veiled. This image of Jesus. When the veil is lifted, and we see the glory of God unleashed before us, there is that within our flesh that says, Woe is me, I am undone. But it is in the beholding of his glory that we are transformed. And it is in that crucible of suffering, of taking up our cross and following him. While we're within that fire, it's not there to punish us. It's not, we're not suffering to pay off our sins, but we're being set free from the false self and its demands for seeking the world to provide us with security and survival, power and control, esteem and affection. And the Lord is saying, no, no. Turn to me, communion with me. This is eternal life, knowing the Father and Jesus Christ, whom he, whom he has sent. That Jesus is in the Father's hand, and we are in Jesus' hand. And it's God's with us in the fire, revealing Jesus, watching intently for Jesus to be revealed. We were made for worship. We were made to be his brothers, children of God. We were made for union with God. So do not fear his work, even when it terrifies you at the, as everything that, all your systems that you thought about God and had God worked out to keep God at a safe distance are deconstructed. 
receive the touch of Jesus. Rise and have no fear. So we come to the table not where the wrath of God is satisfied against sinful flesh, but where God reveals himself to sinful flesh, to a disordered flesh that is craving the presence of God, that is craving the revelation of the Father, not some new truth, but a timeless truth. God is salvation. God is love. God is with us. God is Jesus. So on the night Jesus was betrayed, he took bread and he broke it. This is my body broken for you. In this crucible, the true nature of the Father is revealed as one who pours forth his very essence, his very life for us. Not to punish us, but to rescue us. Not to enslave us, but to set our will free to be one with his will. And he took the cup and he blessed it. He gave thanks. This is my blood, this is my life poured out for you. Drink you, all of it. He's not given us a life that is separate from him. He calls us into union with himself. He has entered into union with us. Not some secret to get God mode like powers. If you just get the right secrets, the right knowledge, the right passwords, you'll have uh, magical prayers. No. The gifts cannot be separated from God. You cannot separate spiritual gifts from the very giver. You can't, you can't pluck them off the cross. You can't pluck them off the tree. You can't pluck them off Jesus and do with them whatever you would. They are forever a part of him. The grace of God, the salvation of God, the knowledge of God, God's worship, this all, the goodness, truth, and beauty, these are all God is the ground of being for all of these things, and they flow from him into us, take root in us, transform us, and they flow back to him as he does works in us, with us, and through us in the world. So come. Come to the table. Drink of him. Commune with him. Amen. Lord, we proclaim you are Emmanuel, God with us. We proclaim that you are Yeshua. God is salvation. Lord, we proclaim that this is eternal life, that we would know you, not things about you, but know you as you reveal yourself in us. And I wish to bless you with the assurance that if you are, if you are in a particularly hot crucible right now, God has not forgotten you. He's not taken his eyes off of you. He's not standing holding you with tongs as you are in the fire, but he holds you. He has engraved you in the palm of his hand. He holds you in his hand. He is in the flames with you as he was with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego because God is revealing himself in you. He is calling you deeper into his presence. He is calling you deeper into that inner sanctuary where you are not just living life for God, but a God with us life. And this is our high calling. May you taste the Father's presence. May you feel the touch of Jesus on you to fear not. For he is life, not destruction. And as all that is false within you 
falls away, it is filled with the light and glory of his presence until all is shining with the light and glory and love of God. This is his glory. This is what he repays for all that we've suffered and lost. His very presence, the transformation of our souls into his likeness. It's peace, presence, and fire. Amen.